I'm Lieutenant Colonel Mike Drowley, and today I'm here to tell you who I am. Now, in standard Air Force presentations and briefings, I dazzle you with PowerPoint skills. I'd have a nice overview telling you what I'm planning on talking about today. And for my biography, I'd go through what my assignments were, the schooling that I've had, the awards that I've won. But instead, today, I'm just going to simply tell you exactly who I am. I'm a Marine rifleman. I'm an Army infantryman. I'm a Navy SEAL. Now, some of you are probably looking at me right now going, no, you're not. <laughs> you're, in fact, none of those things. You obviously have a flight suit on. You're wearing some sort of scarf. Your hair looks amazing. <laughs> <laughs> you, sir, are a fighter pilot. <laughs> But I'm going to argue that last point with you for just a second. I am not a fighter pilot. I'm, in fact, an attack pilot. I drive the A-10 Warthog. And being an attack pilot means that I stand for something that is bigger than myself. To me, I am all those people. I have an extreme amount of empathy for that infantryman that's being shelled by artillery, for that Marine rifleman that's standing out there by himself guarding a hill, for that Navy SEAL who's about to kick down a door for a building where he has no idea what's on the other side. I try and put my shoes, myself in those shoes of every single one of those people. That's what makes me an A-10 attack pilot. And it sounds funny to say, but empathy is probably one of the greatest skills that I have to be able to do that mission. So for me, there's three, world, three words that can stop my world in a heartbeat. And those words are troops in contact. And what troops in contact means is that friendly forces are receiving direct and effective fire. That somebody else is trying to hurt my friends that are on the ground. And when I think of troops in contact, when I'm in a training scenario trying to prepare for the real fight, it sounds a little bit cheesy, but what I think about is that opening scene from Saving Private Ryan on D-Day. When the boat drops, the friendly forces try and storm the beachhead. They're taking that constant and incessant fire. That's what I try and think about those forces are going through on the ground. Every second in my world counts to be able to protect and help those guys out on the ground. And so when I hear troops in contact, that mental clock, that opening scene, starts, sticking, starts ticking through in my mind. It was on 16 August in 2002 that I heard the words troops in contact for the first time in a combat situation come across the radio. I was doing a uh, night support for a team that had just captured a high-value target. They were making their way up out of a valley with the high-value target and were trying to get to a safe house. Uh, the weather was not phenomenal that night. It was stacked up several thousand feet in an overcast deck. Uh, above the weather, Everything was nice. It was like flying over a blanket of snow. There were stars out. The moon was out. But talking to the team on the ground beneath the weather deck, they anticipated that the clouds were about 1,000 feet above the ground. They were right in the middle of a valley. There was blowing wind. There was dust. There was very uh, intermittent rainstorms that were going on. And as I was checking in and talking with them about their situation, the vibe that I was getting is they did not feel like things were, were going well. There was indicators out there that were putting them on edge. Certain things that they were seeing in the town led them to believe that others were aware of their presence. So as this went on, I checked in with my controlling agency and said, hey, I'd like to try and execute a weather letdown to get below the weather just so I can get eyes on this team. So if anything happens, I can be ready for it. I can be there to support them. And as I was doing that coordination, all of a sudden those words came across the radio. Troops in contact. We're taking direct fire. And the thing that was amazing to me is I could actually hear the gunshots and explosions going off in the background as the team member tried to talk to me and tell me that he was under fire at the time. Well, that was all I needed. I then told the controlling agency, I am now going to execute a weather letdown, and I'm going to get down there so that way I can help my buddies out. So executing a weather letdown, it's not the funnest procedure in the world. Uh, when you think about it, at the time, it's 2002. We had no real imagery of the country. We had no real detailed maps. All I had was a Russian map from when the Russians fought in Afghanistan. No English written on it. Uh, no, no numbers that I could recognize, but that's what we used to orient ourselves. I had a GPS point that I would start at. I would hold a very specific heading, reduce the power for an allowed amount of time, and then when that time expired, hopefully I had broken out of the weather. And if it hadn't, then I'd execute a max recovery climb and try and get away from whatever terrain lied on the other side. So I got at my start point, I told my wingman to hang tight, and now I started executing my weather letdown. Reduce the power, tried to hold that exact heading, and now I entered the cloud deck. It's very turbulent. I'm getting bounced around all over the place. And as I'm doing this, I'm doing probably one of the quickest instrument cross-checks I've ever done. 
instrument, 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 outside. Instrument, 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 outside. And as I'm doing that, uh, a little mantra starts as, I, as I'm going through that, and it's, please let this work. Please let this work. Please let this work. And after what seems for a, an eternity, it only turns out to be 10 to 12 seconds, I come shooting out of the north end of the valley beneath the weather. It was about 1,000 feet above the ground. And I ask myself that eternal question, why didn't I listen to my mom when she told me to go work at the local grocery store? <laughs> And the reason came cracking across the radio again as the troops started saying, we're taking more and more fire. We need help now. So I enter a high G turn. I tell my wingman just to stay, to stay up high. There's no way I can fit you down into the fight right now. The Gs really crush you down into the seat. The NVGs sag on your face as you try and turn around. And now I'm trying to look back into the valley. And what spreads out before me is probably one of the most amazing firefights I've, I've ever seen in my life. There's an infrared beacon that's going off that's showing me where the friendly position is. And then there's tracer fire going back and forth, off to the east and from the east into the convoy that I'm trying to get into support. And then halfway up on the mountainside, just at the bottom of the clouds, there's a flash with a corresponding explosion on the valley floor of some sort of mortar team that's trying to hurt my friendly forces down there. So I'm now cruising into the, uh, into the valley at 300 knots, which is pretty fast for an A-10. I'm trying to get in contact with the friendlies. The team member is having trouble talking to me because he's pinned down so heavily by fire that he's hiding behind the truck and he's only able to pop up every once in a while to try and get line of sight with my jet so that way I can hear him. So as this is going on, I'm asking one question. Are you firing to the east or are you taking fire from the west? Which one is it? Where are you firing to? Where are you taking fire from? And what I get back is we are taking fire from the east. So I put my gun cross on the tree line. I close within about 6,000 feet. And then I hammer down for two seconds, which rips 100 rounds into that tree line. And as I come off, I get a blinding effect from my gun, the 30 millimeter shooting off, which gains down my NVGs. I almost have to do a pitch back, a high G pitch back to keep from hitting the side walls of the mountain, which puts me back into the weather. And what greets me on the radio is probably the worst thing a close air support, an A-10 pilot can hear on the radio at that point, and that's complete silence. A thousand things are racing through your mind at that time. Did I just shoot my own friendlies? Have the guys been overrun? Did the guy just get shot who was on the radio? You have no idea what's going on in that time frame. And then finally, as I'm back up into the weather, I get the radio call, probably the best radio call an A-10 pilot can get. Good hits, keep it coming. So I wrap that jet back around, I exit back out of the valley, try and get below the weather again, and then it's another high G maneuver now to get back down, so that way I can support those friendly forces. Another gun run on the tree line, back up into the weather, coming around, and all I keep getting on the radio is keep it coming, keep it coming. And it's amazing because the tracer fire is not stopping. It's not slowing down. Usually, once you show up and you do one flyby, it's broken contact and you get to go home. But this day, the enemy had something going and they knew that it was a good thing. And now they were trying to do as much calm, much harm that they could to those friends of mine that were on the ground. I did two more passes on the tree line, broke it back off, and now switched up to the mortar position when the friendly forces finally started to break contact and now make their way out of the valley. I gathered back up my wingman. We provided support for about 45 more minutes. And then finally, we were able to exit out and go back home once they made, safely made it out of the valley and we're now getting back to their safe house. When I think about that day and uh, what I executed to help those guys out, I'm asked the question every now and then, how could you do that? How could you do a weather letdown with a semi-reliable global positioning system, semi-reliable Russian map into weather in mountainous terrain to try and help those guys out? And the answer is always pretty easy for me. It's because there are fates that are worse than death out there. And in my world, letting something happen to my brothers and sisters on the ground is one of them. It is something that I have sworn that I will never let happen. It is what I have built my entire life, my mission credibility, my whole purpose for being is to protect those forces on the ground. You fast forward to 2003 and you ask who I am. In the first scenario, I said, I am an attack pilot. In 2003, March 23rd, I would answer, I'm a mission commander. I'm a Strike Eagle pilot. I'm a Viper pilot. I'm an HH-60 rescue helicopter crew. Because on the 23rd of March, it wasn't a very good day for our friendly forces during Operation Iraqi Freedom. An MC-130 convo, a uh, train of MC-130s that were going up to do a special operations infill were shot up pretty badly. The convoy that PFC Jessica Lynch was on had taken heavy fire and POWs resulted from that convoy. 
And then there were two AH-64 attack helicopters that were shot down, one right outside of Baghdad. That's the role that I found myself in in the 23rd of March. I was supporting a special operations mission when I heard the comm come over guard that an attack helicopter had been shot down. If you want to talk about something that makes the hair stand up on the back of your neck, it's a crew who's screaming over distress frequency that they've been hit. They don't know where they are. They're going down, and you're helpless to do anything about it. I asked for relief from my special operations mission and was given that, so that way I could pick up the mission commander role to now go and try and do a search and rescue mission for these helicopter pilots that had been shot down. I got an initial set of coordinates from where we figured their radio beacon had initially gone off, and we could hold about 70 miles south of Baghdad. That was our one safe area where we felt like we weren't going to take any kind of enemy fire. As we checked into the hold, my wingman and I must have been doing the same thing at the same time. We were scrolling up our navigation system to see where that down location was. And as we looked up where our system tells us this is where those coordinates are, there's nothing but threats going up in the air. Anti-artillery fire, surface-to-air missiles, explosions. It was like a wall of enemy threats that was up to the north. I remember going to myself, I go back to where I'm holding. The container goes back, it's showing me there's your hold spot. Back up to the objective. Threats, back to where I am. Back up to where the objective is. And from my wingman, all of a sudden I hear, is that where we're going? <laughs> I go, yep, let's lock it up. It's time to go to work. So at this point, everybody wants to help out. We have F-16s checking in. We have Strike Eagles checking in. We have rescue helicopters who are ready to go. And on these rescue helicopters, there's pararescue teams, there's about 14 to 20 servicemen that are on that helicopter ready to go anywhere and do anything that I tell them to do to go pick up those friendly forces. And so my wingman and I try and make our way up north and immediately we start receiving anti-aircraft artillery fire. Surface to air threats are coming up at us. We've gone no more than maybe 10 miles north before we start taking all of this fire. And as we try and make our way up there, I'm trying to make contact with that helicopter crew, and I'm getting very broken and limited comms. Something's keying the mic. Somebody's trying to talk. I hear that somebody's hurt. They think they may be getting close to captured. And I'm like, we've got to do this now. We've got to get up there, or else they're going to get captured. That's all there is to it. And from the ground, the helicopters that are loitering and waiting for me to make the call are saying the same thing. We've got to go. We've got to get up there now. And I'm like, all right, this is, time is of the urgency. We've got to get moving. We're going to start going. I'm going to try and clear a path for you. And I start pushing up north and trading shots with as many threats as I possibly can. And all of a sudden, there was a third person moment that I have where as I'm sitting there cruising up north, my wingman splits off in his own threat reaction. And I remember seeing a fireball from a threat feet away from his aircraft and his A-10 just squirting away from it. And that's when I thought, I'm about to kill 40 Americans. If I send everybody up there, I'm going to kill more people than I saved today. <laughs> And I remember it's the worst call that I've ever had to make in my entire life. I called back to the helicopter crew and I said, abort. And that's like cursing on the, on the radio. It's like swearing in church. I get the what? Back. I said, abort. I'm going to lose more of you than I can save today. And it's the worst feeling to go, I can't make it happen. And I'm about to leave two Americans behind. And I learned shortly thereafter in that silence of radio chatter that I had initially heard from the time that I said, let's go do it, that crew had been captured. They spent 18 days in captivity before they re were repatriated as prisoners of war. But the one thing that kept going through my mind again was, there are some fates that are worse than death. And one of those fates is me sending 20 Americans into what would be certain death as being the responsible mission commander, and that's my role. Now, after I got to do those two uh, operations and during freedom and Iraqi freedom, I got the opportunity to go to the weapons school as an instructor pilot. And I finally had time to reflect on the missions that I had accomplished. And as I was uh, uh, thinking about those missions, something smacked me square in the face, and that was an incongruency that I was living within my life, as weird as it sounds. It happened to me one day when I was stepping out to my jet. A crew chief that was standing there was kind of looking tired, and it irritated me. I was like, hey, let's go. we got to get launched. We're going to step out. It's time to get going. And when I came back, I was doing my post-flight. I think you could still tell that I was irritated that he was not completely with it for the day. I remember he walked up and he was like, you know what, sir, I'm sorry. I uh, didn't get a lot of sleep last night. I'm taking night classes. My wife just had a brand new baby. And all of a sudden, it hit me. I was like, I'm all about service when I crank up that jet. Service leadership, I am about the guy on the ground who's getting shelled. I am all about that Navy SEAL who's about to kick down the door. But in my day-to-day -day life, am I about the airman who's about to deploy for the first time? Am I all about that NCO who's studying for his next test? Am I all about that captain who's 
getting ready to head into his first combat mission. And that's when it hit me that service leadership isn't just an AFSC. It's not a specialty code. It's not just a job. It doesn't happen when you turn on the motors. It doesn't end when you come back and pull into the chocks. It is a second by second, minute by minute service that you owe each and every one when you are in a leadership role. So when people ask me who I am, I still believe I'm an attack pilot. I still believe I am a mission commander. But now my answer is pretty darn simple. I say I'm Lieutenant Colonel Mike Drowley, and I'm an airman. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.